All right, thanks, Randy. Well, uh, today uh, we reach sort of a pivot point. If you look at the churches up there, uh, we are at Thyatira. You remember John is writing from Patmos, and as he sends uh, the letter carrier, he starts in Ephesus, and now we're up at Thyatira. He has made the corner, and he is about to drop on down to the remaining three. And it, it's interesting uh, to me uh, that this church at Thyatira... Uh, gets so much attention. Actually, this is our, our middle letter, our pivotal letter, and it, Thyatira gets the longest letter of all the churches. Uh, Randy is now well aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you, Randy, you did a great job. <laughs> but it gets the longest, and in some ways, the most difficult of all the letters. And one of the reasons it's so difficult is because it's, their problem there is a, an accommodation to the, the society around them and an indulgence in idolatry. And it's, it's really difficult for us to grasp this whole idolatry issue uh, because I, I, the way I like to put it is their idolatry was overt and ours is covert. Uh, they were very open, but they actually did things uh, that we see as constituting idolatry. And then the, the other problem is, we, we kind of get hung up, he talks about sexual immorality and eating things they shouldn't be eating. And so our attention, for whatever reason, goes to those things, and we forget that those things are merely expressions of the idolatry. The sexual immorality and, and the, the eating of the meat were... were a ritual thing that they did when they engaged in idolatry. And we'll see how that, that unfolds as, as we go. But it's hard for us to relate to that because here's what we do. And, and this, when I say we, I mean us, me included. You know, we say, well, we don't engage in those kinds of things. And I don't think anybody in this room does. I would hope not anyway. But we think, so, so we're all good, we're all clear, we don't have to worry about ever slipping into idolatry. But that's not true, is it? We are all capable of slipping into idolatry, and we'll see how that goes as, as we go along. Do you realize that idolatry is the, the thing that God most often speaks against? All through the Old Testament, what was the problem that Israel kept falling into? Idolatry. You see, over and over again, God says, I hate idolatry. Uh, what's the first commandment in the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What's the second one? And no idols either, no graven images. So the first two, directly to that. When, when God judges the kings of Israel in Scripture, what is the one yardstick he rules with to declare them good or evil? It is whether or not they in, allowed the country to indul, engage in idolatry. On that one issue, and, and you can read them for yourself, on that one issue, he declares them either good or evil kings. So idolatry to God is a big deal. A much more bigger deal, I think, than we understand. So that's one of the reasons Thyatira gets this long letter, because they're having such a struggle with that. And as we will see, these are good folks with good hearts that are having this struggle, which should be a red flag for us saying, hey, we're good folks with good hearts. I believe we are. So we need to be on guard for this also. It's interesting that this letter to Thyatira is addressed to the least known, least important, and least remarkable of all the cities that we're going to be talking about. And I think this, again, emphasizes another thing we've been talking about along the way, in that God looks at things differently than we do. Things that aren't maybe a big deal to us are a big deal to him on both the positive and negative side. A little bit of idolatry to Christians today isn't a big deal to us. But it's a big deal to God. 
Now, this isn't necessarily all negative. This is, can be very good news. It can be good news in that if you are in a, a struggling ministry, if you are, have been doing something for years, when God looks at that situation, He says, good job, if you're doing it with a heart that's right, you see. So he looks at little Thyatira and they have all these problems, but they have a lot of good things going on too and he's going to talk about it. Thyatira, Thyatira's identity was molded by commerce and manufacturing. It was what we would call today a blue collar town. Okay. Now, that was important on many levels. Uh, you will remember uh, in, in uh, Acts, the chapter 16, uh, Lydia, you remember the lady Lydia there in Philippi, and she is an importer of purple dye from where? Thyatira. So there were a lot of trades folks going on. They were famous for their working with bronze and metalwork. Uh, they, they were just, had a lot of expertise in that area. And that's, that's important also. But all of these trades had guilds that you had to belong to. It didn't matter whether you were a pottery maker or a carpenter or what you were. You had to belong to the local guild if you were going to work. Now you say, well, that's not so bad. And we think about maybe our modern day union situation. But a guild wasn't like that. A guild, each guild had its own God, its own idol. Now these guilds had festivals. And if you were in the guild, you had to show up for the festival, or at least were expected to show up for the festival. And if you didn't, there were repercussions. You, were, you, were, you weren't given work and that sort of thing. Now, we read the word festival, and we don't think of it like they thought of it, because when they, these guilds had the festival, it was to worship their god. And part of worshiping their gods was to indulge in the sexual activity with the, the, the priestess and prophets of that particular God and then to eat this meat that was sacrificed to idols. And you remember, I think it was last week, we talked about the Jerusalem Council at Acts 15 and, and how they, those were the issues they dealt with. And I think you can see why now, because these were big issues. So one of the, the questions a Christian had to ask in those days is, how can we go in accommodating the things that the world is expecting of us and still remain true to our Christianity and to our God. Now, that was true then and it's just as true now, isn't it? Now, granted, we aren't, we aren't asked, asked to indulge in, in uh, sexual immorality and that sort of thing, but we are asked and pressured by society to do certain things in certain ways, aren't we? Sure. Now, we have to decide between us and our God how far we're going to go in accommodating the things that God tells us not to be a part of. Now here in, in Thyatira, we have this very situation that we see later on in Revelation. You remember when the beast and the mark of the beast and all that, and if you don't have the mark of the beast, you can't buy or sell? Well, this is exactly what's going on here. If you don't belong to the guild, if you aren't a member in good standing, you can't engage in commerce because you don't have any work. If you don't have any work, you don't have any... So this is a, a major, major thing. And we have to answer the same question. How far can we go in accommodating the world? And, and you know, we live in this tension because if you're an employee, God's word is plain. You're supposed to be a good employee. You're supposed to do an honest day's work and all those sorts of things and obey those who God has put in authority over you. Okay. But what about when it comes time and they say, well, okay, now we can't have a Bible, you can't bring a Bible to work, even if you're only going to read it on your own time. Uh, or, you know, other things that come up. You can't talk about this, you can't wear that. Uh, those types of issues. There, there are, are countries now where you can't wear a cross uh, to work. 
and, and things like that. And I don't have the answers. We have, you'll have to come up with the answers yourself because it's between you and God. But it's a question that Christians are continually faced with. How far can we go? What Jesus has to say in this letter. He starts it right out introduces himself as he does all churches and he says this to the angel of the church in Thyatira write the words of the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze so the first thing he does is he introduces himself as the son of God he reiterates that he says I have authority here I have power here and then he says As one who sees everything we talked about that last week. Remember how he searches the hearts and the minds? And isn't that a double-edged sword? Right? Remember? That if our hearts and minds are good, we take comfort in that. If our hearts and minds are inclined toward evil, then we are fearful of that. And he says he has these feet of burnished bronze. That's another emblem of power, of overcoming. Bronze was heavy and, and People were experts, by the way, in, the, in, in bronze and, and making it and making it into weapons and all those sorts of things. And so this was the symbol of the day. And uh, it was also a symbol of power. If you were a lot of the Roman, uh, the Roman legions, the officers had swords made out of bronze. Uh, the, the infantrymen, just the, the line people, they had swords made out of iron. So it's a symbol of power, it's a symbol of strength, and, you know, it's the old thing, the sword cuts both. That's how he introduces himself to them. And then he goes on, and he's, he's, he says, as, as is always the case, he's going to tell them what they're doing right. And these guys are doing some good things, and they're doing them right. In, in verse 19, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. Now, your mind may go over to the church at Ephesus. If you can remember that far back. Did I die? My battery died. You're dying. Maybe that's a sign. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, we have to be impressed with how God evaluates this church because they are small. They're in a small town. They're a small congregation. They're struggling with a lot of things. They have some internal problems. They have people in the church that are engaging in all this uh, stuff that they shouldn't be engaging in. And yet, Jesus commends them for what? Two things. Their love and their faith. Just the opposite of the church at Ephesus, isn't it? You remember Ephesus? God said, I know your works. So you've got it all together. You've got solid doctrine. You're, you're doing all this good stuff. But I have this against you. You have lost your first love. Remember? So love and faith are the two big ones on God's agenda. So while Ephesus was doing great things and had lost its love for Christ, these people are solidly in love with Christ. And he appreciates that. At Thyatira, love and faith were not mere nouns, but they were motivational. Their love motivated them to service. Their faith motivated them to patient endurance. See how that goes? See, you know, it's been, been said that uh, you can serve without loving, but you can't love without serving. Because if you love something, you serve that something, whatever it is. So if you love God, you serve God. If you love people, you serve people. Now, another thing uh, some, somebody once said, uh, we need to learn uh, to use things and love people, not the other way around. And sometimes we get it the other way around, don't we? We want to use people and love things. And that's not good. So their love motivated them to service. And their faith motivated them to patient endurance. 
Now you think about that. Here they are. Some of them have been in this church for years. It's not going anywhere. There's always problems. There's always something going on. And yet God says, because of your patient endurance, I commend you. Boy, that should be good news. If you're ever in a situation where you're struggling, you've got this little ministry and nobody knows anything about it and you, you try to get people to show up and they don't show up and all those sorts of things. And what does God say? He says, patiently endure. Keep on keeping on. And he says, I commend that. I love that. Also in contrast uh, to the church at Ephesus, these people are growing in their spirituality. Notice he says, your latter works are greater than your first. Just the opposite of what he said to Ephesus. Okay. So they're growing spiritually. They're growing in their faith. They're doing a lot of good things. And yet they're having all these problems. We talked a little bit about tolerance along the way. And that is one of the problems with being a loving person is you can fall into this trap of being indiscriminately tolerant. Tolerance is a good thing. We want to be loving people. We want to be kind people. We want to be accepting people. But indiscriminate tolerance becomes a bad thing. It, it's, it's like the pendulum thing. You know, we're, all, we're pendulum people. And we can swing clear over here to justice and righteousness and just cram it down people's throats. Or we can swing clear over here to we just love everybody and accept everything. And both positions are wrong. See, God says love everybody, but he says test the spirits because not everything is from God. So we need to be discriminate. Well, now that he's commended them, he's going to uh, lovingly rebuke them. And he has a rather stinging indictment for them. I'll read it for you. It covers three verses. He says, you tolerate... To tolerate. That's a good word. <laughs> yeah. You tolerate a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent and her sexual, from her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart and I will give to each of you according to your works. Wow. Pretty stinging indictment, isn't it? He says you tolerate this woman Jezebel. Well, who's that? Well, we find her in, in uh, the original Jezebel. We find her in, in 1 Kings. And uh, she's not a very nice person at all. Now, the one here is probably, she's not talking about, when he says the woman Jezebel, he's not talking about an individual. He's talking about this group that are, are, are being led astray and, and that and leading others astray. And he calls them a Jezebel in the spirit of the original Jezebel. And we still use that word from time to time. Uh, and, and what was Jezebel like? What was her, what was the number one thing she did that God hated? Yes, she was from Moab. And her husband was led off to idolatry by her and therefore the country. See? And so that's what these people are doing. And I don't know as Jezebel in this case here in Revelation uh, is even gender specific. I think it could apply to a man also if he's leading God's people into idolatry. And that's the worst thing you can do. And so, he says you tolerate this Jezebel. 
And she's operating within the church, enticing God's people into sexual immorality and spiritual bankruptcy. Now, how does she do that? Well, now remember, it, and it's hard for us to keep focused because we, we want to focus on the sexual immorality. That's bad. But the idolatry here is worse because that's what it grows out of. Okay? That's the root of this thing. But think about it now. You're, you're a guild worker. You're, you're whatever you are, carpenter, pottery maker. And you're not attending these festivals. And so you're not getting the work you should get. And your family's not eating. And now you have this fellow Christian. And he or she is saying to you, well, you know, we're supposed to love everybody and everything. We're supposed to accept everybody and everything. You know, it's not so bad, really, because these idols are just things. They're not real gods anyway. So it's okay if we go to the festival, because we don't really believe that. We really believe in Jesus. So, so we can go, and we, then you can have work. And after all, uh, would God want your family to go hungry? See, they can make a compelling case. Now, you can modernize that and make it fit many, many situations today. Because that's how Satan does it. He doesn't come and hit us over the head. He, he comes around and he seduces us. Little by little, over time, and we get sucked into things. Unlike Ephesus, where they tested the prophets... These folks naively accepted everything. See? Remember one of the things he commended Ephesus for was they tested the prophets to see. And all through the New Testament, we are encouraged to test the spirits, test the prophets. It's interesting to me that we see Christ's long-suffering patience here in that he says he's given these folks time to repent. He's given them time to repent. And they've stubbornly refused. Jesus had given her and her followers many times over opportunities. And now, now there's a part we don't really like, now there are consequences. And this is, this is a sad thing because these are Christian people he's talking about. These are Christ followers he's talking about. Now there are consequences. And what, how does he phrase it? He says there will be great, what? Tribulation for them. He says they will be sick, they will die. He comes down pretty hard, doesn't he? There are consequences. Those who intentionally mislead and those who allow themselves to be misled. Don't think it can't happen to you. Or to me, for that matter. Because not, these were not bad folks. These are good folks. Trying to make a living. Trying to get by. Trying to serve God. And yet they were misled. As I, was, as I was studying for this, I thought about a program I saw on television, geez, I don't know, 20 years ago. And it, it was, uh, had to do with Jim Jones, you may know that name, and the People's Temple. Um, if you look at the history of Jim Jones, uh, he started out right on the money. He was a solid, Bible-believing guy. And the thing that I remembered about this program that I saw on television was it, it was after uh, the, the mass suicide. And by the way, in 1978, that mass suicide, 909 people, 300 children. It was the largest single civilian death in the history of the United States at that time. 9-11 uh, now holds that dubious distinction. But what they were doing in this program is they were interviewing people that had been in the cult but had gotten out before they went down there to Ghana. And before I turned the program on, I thought, well, what kind of goofballs 
would fall for something like this. And I expected to see just, you know, a bunch of homeless types or something. But they were interviewing engineers, teachers, uh, all kinds of educated people, solid people. And yet somehow they were deceived. Now these were the ones that saw it and got out. But as they were talking about the others they knew that didn't, they were talking about sharp, regular folks. See, it can happen to us. And that's why you need to test the spirits. And how do you test the spirits? Against God's Word. That's our measuring rod. So you always have to go there. You know when somebody comes up to you and, and starts the conversation with or throws this into the conversation, beware. And what is it they throw in? They say, you know, God told me. Ever had a conversation with somebody like that? God told me. Well, you can't win. Because how can you argue against God? If God told them. See? So you have to take what they say and test it against what this book says. And then you can determine, because God never contradicts himself. See? And then you can determine where that spirit is. In other words, I have a saying, be Bereans. Acts 17, 11. Uh, Paul says this of the Berean Christians. He says that they were more noble than those who lived in Thessalonica because they received the word eagerly and, here it is, searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. See? So the Bereans were not going to be deceived because they searched the scriptures daily. And that's what I encourage each of you to do. Test the spirits. Well, what about those that patiently endure through all this, that put up with all these people, that hang in there? Well, he says here in verse uh, 24, he says, To the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. And we refer back to the Jerusalem council. In Acts 15, God says, I'm not laying all these rules and things on you. I'm just saying, love me. Keep your eyes fastened on me. And then he goes on and he says, if you do this, if you hold fast until I come, the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to, whom I, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Wow. So to those who endure patiently, to those who conquer, and remember we talked about who it is that we're going to conquer? Who is that? Ourselves, remember? That's who we have to conquer. Uh, if, if we're going to live according to God's instruction, we have to conquer ourselves and bring ourselves. You know, remember how Paul says that in, in Corinthians, he says, I buffet my body and discipline myself. And that's what we need to do. So we dis our, discipline ourselves. We conquer our urge to flee or to flake out or to allow ourselves to be led astray. And we hang in there patiently enduring because of our faith in Christ. Uh, then he says, one day we will rule and reign with Christ. But there's a, a phrase in here that sometimes bothers us. What about this rod of iron? How many of you want to be ruled by a rod of iron? Does that sound like a good thing? Okay, well you're right. It is a good thing. <laughs> well we read that and if we don't have some, some idea of what that means, it sounds negative, doesn't it? But think about what is the most comforting portion of scripture in the entire Bible. Use the most and when people need to be comforted. You all know the answer. It's the 23rd Psalm, right? 
Yea, do I walk through the blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, the 23rd Psalm, the fourth verse says this. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now, this rod and this staff are going to comfort them. See, what we don't know is, when we see all these little pictures about the shepherds, what do we always see them with? A staff, right? Yeah. But in reality, shepherds carried two things with them. They carried a rod and a staff. And they're both defensive weapons. And the rod, they were really good with this rod. They were, it was used hardened wood. And it's amazing what they could do with that thing. The way they could throw it and that. You didn't want to mess with a shepherd if he had his rod. Now there's only one thing wrong with these wooden rods. What would that be? Well, they can break, huh? So if you have a rod of iron, it's not going to break. So if you are being ruled over or ruling with a rod of iron... Again, that's one of those double-edged things. If you're one of God's people and he is shepherding over you with a rod of iron, nothing can harm you. It's a comforting thing. If you are not, then it's not a comforting thing. And this word will rule over, that's interesting. Uh, the, that word rule is poimene, and it's the same word that was translated shepherd. So you could literally translate it, he will shepherd them with a rod of iron. Now shepherd sounds a lot better than rule, doesn't it? Sure it does. It's the same word in Acts 20, 28 where he tells the elders to shepherd the flock of God. Same word, okay? So if we patiently endure... He is going to rule over us and we are going to rule with him in that way. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And he's going to give us the morning star. Well, what's that? Well, as we read in Revelation twenty-two sixteen, 16, Jesus says this, I am the root and descendant of David, the bright and morning star. It's pretty cool. He's talking about our relationship with Christ. And finally, in verse 29, he says this. He who has an ear, let him hear. <clears throat> we want to put that in modern day vernacular. We might say, listen up. Pay attention. This is important. Be alert. You know, Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, he says, to be on the alert. Because Why? Because our adversary prowls around like a roaring lion looking for an opportunity. Remember, we are called to love God and love people while at the same time not tolerating evil. And I know that's a tough one. Because not all things that appear to be good are good. And not all things that appear to be evil necessarily are evil. So we have to learn to do as Jesus does and look beyond what we merely see and judge it according to what this book says. One commentary put it this way regarding the church at Thyatira. Jesus loves their love but hates their indiscriminate tolerance. And that's, kind of, that's hard for us to get but we need to get it and love people and hate evil and it's hard to do at the same time. So, once again, we see that as he wrote this book, he wrote it to real people in real time and they needed to hear the message and it's just as applicable today to us and it'll be just as applicable a thousand years from now. Another thing I'm beginning to see here that I hope you are too is that all of these churches need each other because they all have some strengths and they all have some glaring weaknesses. Kind of describes us, doesn't it, as individuals. We all have some strengths and we all have some weaknesses. So God mixed us up so that we're not 
all alike and puts us together so we can complement each other, so we can shepherd each other, so we can help each other. And together we are, as the banner says, the church. It's pretty awesome. Father, thank you that uh, you are shepherding over us. Lord, thank you that you are ruling and reigning. And Lord, as we continue to uh, see how you're revealing yourself to these churches, it's a, it's a comforting thing to know who you are. And Lord, yes, sometimes it's a little fearful. But Father, we, we want to uh, keep our eyes on you. We don't want to be seduced into any sort of idolatry, which is just simply putting anything above you. Lord, it's hard in the society we live in, just as it was hard in the society they lived in. So help us, O oh God, to truly put you first, to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.